I'm Sarah Kenzier, the author of the bestsellers The View from Flyover Country and Hiding in Plain Sight, and of the upcoming book They Knew, How a Culture of Conspiracy Keeps America Complacent, available for pre-order now. I'm Andrea Chalupa, a journalist and filmmaker, and the writer and producer of the journalistic thriller Mr. Jones, about Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine, a film the Kremlin doesn't want you to see, so be sure to see it. And this is Gaslit Nation, a podcast covering corruption in the United States and rising autocracy around the world. Welcome to our special spring series, Gaslit Nation presents Rising Up from the Ashes, Cassandra's and other experts on rebuilding democracy. Our bonus episodes, available to Patreon subscribers at the Truth Teller level and higher, feature our esteemed guests taking the Gaslit Nation self-care Q&A. So for fun ideas, sign up to hear that. Joining at this level also gives you access to hundreds of bonus episodes on topics in the news today. We'll be back with our regular episodes in July. If you're signed up anytime between now and then at the Democracy Defender level or higher on Patreon... You'll get special access to watch a live taping of Gaslit Nation over the summer. More details to come. This interview is recorded on December 20th, 2021. Today, we have a remarkable and inspiring expert with us today, Maxim Aristavi. He is an Eastern European journalist and writer. His work explores the intersection of identity politics, disinformation, and Russian colonialism, A self-described bridge builder, he amplifies and explains stories from global frontline battles for equal human and civil rights. He is a transatlantic leadership fellow with the Center of European Policy Analysis, a DC-based foreign policy think tank, co-founder of the Free Press for Eastern Europe that manages the largest hub for independent journalism in Eastern Europe, a former policy advisor at the European Parliament, writer for the Washington Post, Politico, Foreign Policy, among others, and sits on the managing board of Kiev Pride, the biggest pride event in Eastern Europe. Aristavi is a 2015 Pointer Fellow at Yale University with a focus on informational wars and pan-regional LGBTI civil rights movements. Welcome to the show, Maxim. Hey, I'm super excited to join and a huge fan of your work and the show in general. So this is extra special for me this time. Well, it's an honor to have you here. Um, So obviously Ukraine is a hot topic um, now, unfortunately, for all the wrong reasons, uh, because of Trump's corruption, because of Putin's aggression that's ongoing and escalating and spreading around the globe. Um, And also we have our own social conditions in the U.S. that are incredibly concerning. Uh, Corruption's on the rise. Um, Life expectancy is is declining in America. So corruption has become a hotbed issue. Obviously, Ukraine has had a number of inspiring popular uprisings to confront corruption. It's known for having a very strong civil society. Uh, You yourself are an independent journalist that have been on the front line of all these big movements. Um, and so we would love to hear from you today, you know, how does corruption mm. work in Ukraine and generally in the region, just so we could better prepare ourselves for how to mm-hmm. confront it, or, you know, here in the U.S.? Mm, sure, absolutely. i would be happy to be of help, although, you know, as a, a Georgian Ukrainian, uh, kind of explaining for everyone in Ukraine, actually, kind of explaining Ukraine became a second job for everyone in the last seven, almost eight years. Uh, and I, I'm, I, I so love that the majority of Ukrainians, despite of all constant frustration of explaining, defending, um, you know, validating themselves to the, the rest of the world, the majority of us still keep doing that. Like it's a, it's a not a big deal, although a bit frustrating sometimes. So happy to do it. In my second job, that's for sure. So Ukraine is obviously fighting two wars: the Kremlin's ongoing invasion and corruption. What are the biggest obstacles holding Ukraine back in its war on corruption? I mean, coming from Ukraine, corruption becomes uh, so embedded within everyday life. Uh, You face it already as a kid. For example, like when you at school or kindergarten, that's where the majority of us already start facing corruption one way or another. 
you got to pay your way through a lot of services that you get in in the country and of course when i was growing up in 90s it was much much worse than it is right now and the country uh made a tremendous progress with it i uh, especially in the last uh, you know 5 7 years but still it's uh, something that is part of your everyday life and i think the majority of uh, foreigners especially westerners do not understand how how integral it is to their uh, life and it's not just an inconvenience it actually alters the way you think oftentimes about the state the government the services that you get and stuff like that but the, the most important thing that i kind of realized in the recent years that when i was growing up corruption was definitely kind of a local problem in a way that it had something to do with uh of course the legacy of uh russian rule and colonialism and had something to do with the cultural aspects of it how people were you know considering to pay bribe or not but recently we've seen that this is not a local fight anymore and as kleptocracy in general became such a prominent global issue no matter how hard you fight it back at home on local level you still cannot win and because the issue became so ginormous global issue and without addressing it everywhere uh, both in the west and at front lines you won't get much done anyway because this is just too big uh, to call it a, a local or you know national fight anymore That's exactly what we say on the show. Kleptocracy anywhere is kleptocracy everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm still kind of a solutions guy and I always want to look into how we can fix it instead of just being upset and frustrated and angry about it. But uh, uh one of the most frustrating thing about talking about Ukrainian corruption with uh, uh the rest of the world, especially with westerners, is that it's the discussion always starts with, well, you need to fix your corruption problem. and for that you need to do a b c and you know it's basically kind of a lecturing till it's happening and what i'm always fire back saying that the this corruption and this problem with corruption that we are dealing first and foremost starts in the west these days because no matter what kind of laws you have on in place no matter how terrific your civil society anti corruption fighters are and ukrainians are amazing at this we always face the problem that the majority of stolen uh funds of stolen money of stolen resources that just be channeled from uh, out of our country are ended up on western bank accounts in western real estate uh all across uh, the uh western world and unless we close that that opportunity for you know for our oligarchs or officials to steal and then transfer it to the west we won't fix anything it's just impossible so you are stuck with the west lecturing you on how to clean up your corruption at the same time empowering and profiting off of your corruption well of course because you know it's not only how our crooks uh store their money in the west is also the whole industry around it they hire the best people to whitewash their reputations they hire the best lawyers to kind of bypass any legal troubles and they might have with their money in the west i mean you know better than anyone that there is well oil industry in the west that helps all sorts of kleptocrats coming from places like ukraine or elsewhere and a lot of people profit handsomely from that and unfortunately we don't see a lot of action happening on that front from our western partners uh they always come and say like you got to fix this and this in your parliament but what do we get you know in terms of your uh, homework done in the west i think that's where the action is dramatically lacking so oh, without question and what are some ways the that ukrainians suffer because the west refuses to clean up and confront its own extraordinary powerful and global corruption industry uh, you know there's a running joke among a lot of ukrainians that about the corruption in ukraine because uh, since ukraine uh, gained independence 3 years ago from uh, russian rule 
um, the this constant graft keeps happening, and people are even back in Ukraine. People are really surprised that you know, there's still so much stuff to to steal, and stealing keeps happening. I mean, my life was dramatically impacted by this kind of uh, graft of corruption because when Ukraine became independent, I wouldn't say that it was a poor country. Definitely not. But the the amount of wealth that has been stolen in recent 30 years from us, it counts in tens of billions. And most of those money were channeled and are keep being channeled uh, abroad to private bank accounts, to real estate and so on and so on. So this this is has not uh, not only has the impact on how much people uh, receive in salaries here, but also on the quality of infrastructure because uh, wealthy kleptocrats do not pay any taxes; they all channel it back abroad. On the way, um, you enjoy just a lower quality, much lower quality of life that you deserve based on how much you work and how much education you have. So I'm a migrant. And I had to leave Ukraine at some point, uh, as many as as millions of other Ukrainians, exactly for the same thing. Because no matter how smart you are, how much of education you have, how much hardworking you are, and majority are extremely hardworking, you still get less in everything, quality of life, just because so much of it has been stolen or is being stolen as we speak. Obviously, the West likes to see itself as sacred, the lecturer, what have you. They're the donors. They're the ones who Ukraine is getting a lot of support from the EU and the US and Canada. One could argue not enough, certainly given its challenges. But what's hiding behind that is the profit, the private industry, the well-oiled machine of corruption. But what about Russia specifically? How is Russia profiting from corruption in Ukraine? And how is Russia leveraging corruption in Ukraine as a weapon in its multi-front war against Ukraine. Yeah, that's also, I think, that very often absent from the talks about the corruption in Eastern Europe when it comes to our friends from the West. Because they usually come and say, well, you have this problem with your corruption. But what is uh, often not mentioned, that corruption is a not new phenomenon that started from the day one after Russian neighbors gained independence after the Soviet Union collapse. The corruption festered and was part of everyday life of many people living under Soviet rule for many, many years before the Soviet Union collapsed. And it partially was the reason why it collapsed, because economically it wasn't viable and corruption was, was existing at the top levels for uh, many decades. And this culture now is uh, on the ground, oftentimes associated with that legacy. So the majority of people, especially those people who are engaged in corruption, both on both sides, those who extort bribes from you and those who are willing to pay, you can clearly see that there is a generational divide. So for younger people like myself, paying a bribe is very uncomfortable. You kind of, you know, I, I, I was part of many situations when I had to pay bribe. I'm very honest about it. But uh, every time for me, it wasn't a natural thing to do. And I, I felt bad about it and coerced. And definitely with the time as I became, you know, more prominent and I had the opportunity to speak out and help to fix this problem, I started doing something. And a lot of Ukrainians of my age are doing the same. But for people of older generations who were used to pay or, you know, face corruption for many years before the uh, independence, it's kind of a more uh, natural way of living. And I think this is something that's missing from the conversation. That is the corruption that we're dealing in Ukraine and elsewhere um, in Eastern Europe is part of the Russian rule legacy. And modern Russia, of course, is one of the most corrupt places on Earth. Keep using um, this as a part of a foreign policy, extortion, uh, geopolitical tool, for sure. Because corruption offers them a lot of opportunities to uh, influence former colonies in one way or another. Also not probably very uh, unique story uh, for this post-colonial dynamic anyway. This takes us to the point that the Soviet Union is a gaslighting term <laughs> and that yeah. it was never a union. It was just straight up brutal Russian imperialism. 
in my own worldview that I kind of constructed over the years, I see it as just one of the stages of Russian colonialism in general. And I mean, I grew up in Ukraine and Russia was part of our lives despite the independence for a long time, but it's always been kind of a plain destructive role. Of course, it wasn't as bad as during after the 2014 invasion, but even before, it wasn't kind of a secret that Russia meddles, influences things, you know, supports some of the destructive forces in the country, finances some political parties, even before 2014 revolution and 2004 revolutions, pro-democratic revolutions, Russia would openly have a say who the government uh, should appoint to key, you know, government positions. It wasn't like a big secret. And I was trying to make a sense of it. Why would Russia do that, right? Why, you know, all the crises, the, the crises that we have uh, would always have something to do with Russia, and then I start like digging and making sense of it myself and looking back at history and looking back at the other, you know, similar situations around the world. And I mean, it became obvious that this is just classical colonial relations between uh, colonial power and the colonial subject. And then things kind of clicked for me and made start making more sense why this is happening, why this toxic dynamic is there and why Russia wouldn't let go of this issue or the countries uh, it previously ruled. Yeah, I know we had that same issue in the U.S. We discovered with Trump, especially when he picked Rex Tillerson as Secretary of State. And there's a lot of reporting about how Rex Tillerson, as the former CEO of Exxon, was going to make a ton of money (laughs) and lift sanctions and Exxon stood to gain. So there's a whole complication there, which made Americans feel like, under Trump, yeah. uh, given the well-documented support and meddling and whatever you want to call it, that the Kremlin gave Trump to help bring him to power, that there was benefits that Putin was getting in return. It was this feeling of, oh, great, he's our Yanukovych. He's our <laughs> guy. So, so um, yeah, that that's what it is. It's Russian colonialism. Uh, when you have a f- foreign power with imperialist ambitions and a long imperialist history as a brutal colonizer influencing your government to the point of um, tipping the scales of government and elections and so forth. That's your proxy state, essentially. Yeah. And I mean, toxic relations between Ukraine and Russia go back way before the Soviet Union. So Ukraine was a, col- a Russian colony for hundreds of years before that. And Ukraine had statehood and, you know, attempts to create statehood and different insurgencies for hundreds of years. And also a lot of that history has been erased um, with, you know, clear intent by the Kremlin. So the majority of people outside, they don't even realize that Ukraine has history of statehood that dates back much earlier than Soviet Union, and then even before that, because all that history was purposely erased and and still Kremlin pays a lot of attention so that it does not resurface, not only for Ukraine, but other former Russian colonies. And I think this is important thing that people just educate themselves if they're interested uh, in Russia, about what Russia is, as a as a state and it's it doesn't you know the history of that state doesn't necessarily start on 1991 after the soviet union collapse but you can see a clear pattern of actions and the treatment of the countries around russia for many centuries it looks a lot like for example a situation with ireland or scotland where people not necessarily divided by racial dynamic in the colonial relations, but it's still much, you know, pure colonialism in its pure form. Yeah, absolutely. And what's really must be so frustrating for you, and it is absolutely for me, is how you have these Westerners who go through the education systems in the West. They go to university, graduate school, and they're learning from all of these lionized professors who had some, you know, read Dostoevsky and had some mm. romantic notion about what, what Russia is. 
And so a lot of these kids, these college students would go on to um, hold jobs as analysts in newsrooms, researchers, Mm -hmm. and so forth. So a lot of the Western understanding of Ukraine has been through a Russian lens, because that's Mm -hmm. how a Western audience has been trained to think of that part of the world, coming in through um, Russian political power, through the Cold War, Russian literature, and so forth. And Ukraine has always been ghettoized as sort of this backwards mm. um, heathen tribe that needs to be mm. just brought to heel. Like that's sort of been the understanding, even though Ukraine, and I just want to tell people whether this is, a, you know, this may be a revelation for some folks, Ukraine's own culture and history is many centuries older than the existence of Russia in the first place. And it, Kiev is considered the Jerusalem of the Slavs. It was a king, there was a mm-hmm. kingdom there, a, Byz- a Byzantium kingdom that used to marry off their princesses all across Europe. And the and Anne of Kiev, who, who married into the Franks, she yeah. ruled France. Her husband died, <laughs> Henri died, and left leaving Anne of Kiev to be the queen of France, ruling that country. Her descendants transformed France completely, including building the Louvre. So I read this extraordinary book on the history of Paris. And it talked about how mm. backwards Paris was. And then here comes oh, Anna yeah. Kiev. And Anna <laughs> Kiev just whips it into shape because the kingdom, Kiev Rus, that she left in Kiev, that was a literate kingdom. That was a kingdom that was very formal. They'd have like 12 meals at dinner. And she and she gets to France and her husband can't, like, can't read. <laughs> like signs yeah. his name with an X. I only can read. I, yeah. I remember from school, we would read uh, through her letters that she would send from Paris after mm-hmm. she arrived. And she was so distressed. She was like, God, these people smell and they don't wash. And it's just unbearable. And I cannot stand being inside the buildings all the time because it's so unhygienic and stuff. And she was, she had the, the most massive cultural shock. Because their life would be like, just felt like it was centuries, you know, away from that. If you're wondering where Ukraine's stubborn, tenacious, fearless national pride and identity comes from, it's because it's an extraordinarily old and proud and impactful culture that is centuries older than Russia. And Russia, in Ukrainian eyes, Russia looks like a belligerent teenager that can't keep its shit together. I think the majority of Ukrainians do not... Of course, they're proud of long uh, ancestry and stuff like that. But they don't see other nations around them as like it's not at someone's expense, right? right? Even when it comes to Russia, of course, it's kind of we all understand that when Ukraine already had, wouldn't be called Ukraine, but Ukraine already had, had hundreds of years of uh, statehood uh, history and stuff like that. Moscow wasn't like even existing. But what f- is frustrating that for uh, it's not the first time in the history of when colonial empire just appropriates history of subjugated nations and countries and lands and then try to reshape it and, you know, take the best parts to as- assign it to its own history and stuff like that. And then you can see the same kind of dynamic. And if, for example, you hear the conversations that are happening in some Western countries when it comes to colonial rule which again, also not ideally addressed the issue, right, for many Western countries at the moment. But then at least you see some conversations about like, okay, so we have these best museums in Paris and Berlin, um, even in States, and uh, they're filled with stuff stolen from other lands and, you know, kind of appropriated as part of cultural legacy of these countries. And now people try to untangle it and, you know, maybe talk about returning some of that stolen stuff back to where it belongs and stuff like that. But it's not happening when it comes to Russia, because a lot of foreigners go to Hermitage and they're like, wow, this is one of the f- most fantastic museums in the world. But the majority of stuff there is stolen from other countries that Russia ruled uh, before that. And nobody even kind of questions it or tries to address it in any ways. Where do you think that comes from? Is it because Russian disinformation is so effective and Putin always beats on and on about Russophobia any time mm-hmm. anyone tries to call the Kremlin out for its aggression? Why do you think the West tends to give so much 
sympathy or generosity towards towards mm-hmm. excusing Russia's colonialism and aggression. You answered this question yourself a bit earlier when you pointed out to absolute lack of diversity when it comes to people who are in charge of Russia policy or in charge of Russia coverage in the West and, you know, people who are in think tanks, in universities, in media who cover this region uh, as their job. And you're absolutely right. The majority of those people are white, they're male, coming from specific... (laughs) White, male, and mediocre, checking all the boxes. Sorry, go on. (laughs) Well, and yeah, and this lack of diversity, I was, you know, because I spent years just thinking, why is this happening? You know, why you spend so much time and you try to explain, you're trying to educate people, although again, this is not what we're supposed to do. That's kind of very intense labor. We're not paid for this. Mm -hmm. But um, as Ukrainians or as Eastern Europeans, you try to educate them and it's kind of you hitting the wall all the time. And then I realized through help of other friends from the West who do not come from the same socio-racial economic background who are like, you know, just look at it. How does it look like for you? What kind of gender race those people are, how wealthy they are, what kind of universities they finished, you know, graduated from and stuff like that. And then for me, it was eye opener. And once I looked at this problem through the problem of diversity and racism and economic background, it made total sense for me. It all clicked. Even the way they talk to us, because the majority of Ukrainians and people in Eastern Europe are also white, but they the same Western white supremacy dynamic also works with us because they keep telling us that we're not white enough, we're not educated enough, we're not civilized enough to check all the boxes for agency so they can assign us an agency, right? So why we have to convince and provide evidence every time to a lot of those Westerners, why we, for example, have the right for sovereignty, or why we have the right for agency and not just like a domain for other colonial power. And then it just like hit me. Yeah, they are complacent with Russian colonialism because in their view, it's nothing. um, I mean, it's not as bad because in their worldview, this just does, does not like click with them as much to sympathize in general. Yeah. That's the issue is a lot of these white mediocre males that make up the newsrooms and the think tanks and and so and the analysts at financial institutions and so forth covering Eastern Europe, it's the r- Russian romanticism they come through. And that's their lens. And it reminds me so much of Americans who refuse to let go of the romanticism of their quote unquote heritage, the Confederacy, refuse to acknowledge that Thanksgiving <clears throat> is whitewashing genocide, a genocide so great that of the Native Americans that it literally changed the global mm-hmm. climate. So, there's yeah. a, you know, and, and like, of course, Santa Claus can't be black. <laughs> it's like, mm. it's like they don't, re- they may see themselves. So these, these so-called, we'll just say for this Western lens of, of Ukraine and mm. so forth, they may see themselves in their home countries of America, Canada, the UK, Germany, and so forth as liberal progressive, open-minded, feminist, whatever they may identify as. But when it comes to understanding Ukraine, all they see, they just sum it up to poor white people. And historically, even today, poor white people, whether they come from Ukraine, Poland, or elsewhere, are seen as less privileged, less deserving, less human, and tools on a chessboard. We have yeah. that. Yeah, they're tools on a chessboard. And so a, it's really frustrating because a lot of, I would think, I'll be generous and say a lot of well-meaning people, including on the left, um, see Ukraine as just a chess piece in the big war yeah. between Russia and the US, not a state with its own sovereignty, its own national identity, yeah. its own rich history. I mean, when you had Euromaidan, the Revolution of Dignity, which was a popular uprising, not a CIA coup that mm. a lot of leftists um, who listen to RT Russia Today one, framed it as, what you had there on Maidan Square in Kiev were a lot of, uh, you'd, you'd have posters or murals of some of Ukraine's 
greatest poets, the Walt Whitmans mm. of Ukraine, um, the Emily Dickinsons of Ukraine. Like you had, of course, um, Lesia Ukrainka and uh, Fra Shevchenko. And, and these were poets that used the resistance mm. of art to uh, the coded language of poetry to fight for all sorts of human rights on the front lines and, and, and push a universal freedom. And, and so that's why... And was, against Russian colonialism as well, exactly, back in yeah. 19th, 18th century. Yeah, and pay a price for it. And so it's just so maddening to be up against that that horrible ah. lens <laughs> because <laughs> in the years leading up so in the year you know the years of 2013 2014 with the revolution in ukraine followed by putin's invasion and those years when people like you and i and so many others were screaming about how dangerous putin was how these yeah. bots were seeing these kamikaze kremlin bots that were in full force, all the disinformation, how effective the disinformation mm. was, we were getting drowned out by the mediocre white men in the media who were trying to label us as hysterical. And they were vicious. Oh, they always, that's their synonymous word for people who are, you know, not white enough or not Western enough. They just like being hysterical because mm. that's what they do. You don't have any credibility unless you're a, a white straight man. In who went to the University of Chicago or some, you know, and like and has some cloistered media or think tank job in some major city, but um, yeah, that's when you get credibility. But uh, and so, but they were so vicious to deal with. In all those years, people like you and I were trying, and 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 my co-host Sarah were trying to warn people about Kremlin aggression mm-hmm. and getting drowned out and dismissed and harassed. And then yeah. Trump comes to power using all the mechanisms we had warned about, how Kremlin aggression works, how disinfo- Kremlin disinformation works. And suddenly they were like shocked. They were shocked. <laughs> they were like, what? <laughs> and then they switched gears and became the, oh, this won't be so bad. Stop being hysterical. Right. And now they sound yeah. like us. Now they finally sound like us. I remember that um, some years ago, I also wrote an op-ed for I think it was for foreign affairs where I kind of, you know, like I said that I, I never thought I'm going to be in position where I feel like my experience of living in a very corrupt, captured by oligarchs uh, state and region will be of help to Americans. But now I think this is like exactly what you can benefit from that experience and to know what to expect because this is exactly what is happening to you. <laughs> and it, it was even shocking for me as well to realize, but also it helped me to realize a lot about what is happening in the States from the, this particular lens, because I think that all the things that you mentioned, they uh, take roots in some of the blind spots about how Americans see themselves in general. And of course, some reckoning is happening somewhere in some in many aspects of American life, um, in entertainment, in uh, in politics. Uh, the reckoning when it comes to racism and and uh, misogyny and uh, you know the um, the income inequality. But one of the biggest blind spots that still is there and unaddressed when it comes to these issues is foreign policy. In foreign policy and media coverage of uh, outside world, that's where that reckoning hasn't happened at all. And that's why we see when it comes to specifically Russia, not because Russia is so important that it's not the number one issue for uh, that sphere for sure. There are many other impressive crises, but because in on that intersection, you clearly see what's the problem of uh, American foreign policy and the view of Americans of the outside world. It still hasn't been decolonized in not a bit. It still kind of overprojects uh, the view that is lax and devoid of any diversity whatsoever. And I think once Americans start addressing that, it will be easier to navigate through foreign policy crises that the country is dealing for. Because one of the running jokes now back in the region that people thought that Trump is like, you know, horrible and messed up with the region and blackmailed us and, you know, did a lot of damage. But I wouldn't say that 
people are very satisfied with the way Biden is handling the region either. I mean, of course, it's marginally better, but it's still we have the same problems that we had with Trump and the same same problems we had with Obama and administrations before that just do not get the region, cannot get through this wall of misconception that, again, I still, you need to go through it by looking, have self-awareness uh, uh, before, you know, before uh, trying to fix those problems elsewhere. What would you like Biden and his foreign policy team to do to meaningfully support and help mm. Ukraine right now? Well, first, again, there's, of course, long-term remedy, but I would also bring more diversity to those foreign policy teams, not only in Russia, but elsewhere. I don't think it's okay that we uh, deal with majority of people who are from specific socioeconomic and race, uh, uh, racial background uh, all the time, majority of them men and stuff. So once you bring diversity, and it's not only just a feel fact, there's actual um, evidence, academic evidence showing that more diversity uh, in teams brings better results when addressing especially crisis-prone situations. So I think from long term, that would be of the most help to see more diverse people on those teams. But in short term, I think kleptocracy should be a priority number one. Not so much, you know, geopolitics in general, but once you crack down on the ways Eastern European and other foreign kleptocrats use Western countries, Western world, including the United States to uh, whitewash their money, but also whitewash their reputations and uh, store their stolen goods, that's when I think a lot of other problems will you know, start untangled, even with Russia, because a lot of people, you know, say, oh, there's such a bad, you know, big headache. How do you deal with a nuclear power that is so aggressive? But they, for years, everyone, just including from Russia, keeps saying that just be effective on closing loopholes that allow them to store their wealth in the West. And that's going to be the most effective policy they can probably have in this kind of situation with these kind of regimes. And I don't know if they'll ever do it because, you know, someone's <laughs> going to lose profit if you close all those loopholes? Uh, well, I'm kind of a no bullshit guy. So for me, at least if you admit this problem, that would be already good enough for me, at least as a start, because now I don't think there's much honesty is happening. So of course you can, at least when the public is going to be uh, aware of that. And I'm not sure the majority of public even understands how much money is there to in the, all this industry of whitewashing and supporting uh, foreign kleptocrats is there in the West. Once we at least start being you know, honest about it and the uh, local public will be more aware of this issue, I think it would be at least a, a start, I think. So obviously we've touched throughout this conversation on kleptocracy as a means for state capture. So what warning do you have there about like, if we don't clean up our corruption, Russia will just have a field day with us and so forth. Uh, gosh, I think I could be a bit biased about the focus, but for me, it's important to pay attention to uh, media outlets and the health of the media industry in general. Because as you see, not only from the places that suffered uh, from uh, kleptocracy and corruption, but also the places that recently had unfortunate rollbacks in democracy like Hungary and Poland that are now, you know, in many respects are doing worse off compared to Ukraine, say, in terms of democracy. One of the warning signs that we always saw there is a first would come through the dramatic decrease in press freedoms and health of journalism in general. And I think for many autocratic regimes, this is part of the effective toolbox that, you know, not only you have the opportunity to be financially effective at uh, hiding your wealth or like hiring both armies and creating all kinds of, ex you know, extorting and exploiting the weaknesses of Western social media platforms. 
but also you attack newsrooms, independent journalism first. And that's where erosion starts. I don't want to be too corny about it, but I like the uh, tagline for Washington Post, that democracy dies in darkness. And um, this is this is just life proven fact. This is what we've seen in recent years in Hungary, where the autocratic government started cracking down on independent journalism first to cut off the public from um, reliable source of information, to cut out uh, the ability of journalists to investigate, to bring light to the problems. And then it's just easier for them to go from there. And I think, unfortunately, I mean, you can probably agree with me, the, these are tendencies are very uh, on the display in the United States, especially uh, regarding the dissemination of um, the field of local journalism, which is just lays in ruins across the states. Oh, absolutely. And the consolidation of far-right media. We had Fox News for many years, and then suddenly we had One America Network, and then Sinclair yeah. was buying up local TV networks. So you're saying that you're seeing a danger. Well, I'm seeing it too, <laughs> but just to, <laughs> just to continue this thread. So you're seeing a dangerous corruption of our media industry here in the U.S. that looks very similar to other patterns you've seen in countries like Hungary and Poland that have declined in, in terms of democracy. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the kind of the, the effect of all of it is to marginalize journalism in general. And this marginalization starts with the destruction of local journalism, because that's where the most important link between the public and journalism is happening. Because the, the national media do not have the capacity or it's not even the format to kind of pay attention to small local communities. But also, you know, with my two decade experience of working in journalism and supporting dependent uh, newsrooms on press freedom front lines, I learned that the most impactful journalistic investigations also happening on the local level. They don't necessarily have millions of views, but they deliver the most impact. And that's where the audience pays some more attention uh, as well. You know, the majority of people, regardless of the country, they don't consume news regularly. Um, so maybe like around 30%, depending on the country, would tune in to news regularly to check on something. But the majority of this percentage you know, is rising dramatically higher when it comes to local news. Not only you know, could be linked to trivial, like you know, checking weather updates or weather emergencies and stuff like that, but it's also kind of trickles down to more serious topics like, uh, say, corruption and stuff like that. And we've seen this similar situation where a lot of local newsrooms are being bought out, closed down, um, starve of resources, and then just like 10 years from that, the collapse of democracy is starting because the majority of coverage is happening by national media that are being like divided and accumulated by oligarchs or uh, subjugated by the state. And that's where the situation becomes really, really irreversible. Yeah, exactly right. That's exactly right. And um, you're basically left with a media landscape that is decentralized, it's commercialized, and it's owned by oligarchs, essentially. And you're basically at the mercy of whether those are, quote unquote, good oligarchs or bad oligarchs. And so th there is no good oligarch, in my opinion, because uh, even the existence of an oligarch is a policy failure. And yeah. But so we, th this is essentially the media landscape in Ukraine, and the U.S. is already well on its way headed there. Well, yeah, I would even say that when it comes to regional media, Ukraine is even doing a bit better than the States. But yeah, this is, I would even look for more warning sites in places like Hungary than even Ukraine. But for Ukraine, or for example, for other Eastern European states like Georgia, it was also part of the problem uh, when you see the rollback in democracy, especially we're seeing now in Georgia, for example, where a lot of media outlets, uh, the major top media outlets are divided up between pro-government, anti-government oligarchs. It just uh, contributes to extreme toxic polarization when in fact media outlets are engaged in the uh, 
political polarization and political fight rather than serving the public. And that's what we're seeing, for example, in Georgia, where you know, if there is no one government, one media policy kind of situation, but where media outlets and most popular are divided by uh, uh, oligarchs and power, political powers and conflict, and they just gaslighting the public so much that there is impossible to imagine any dialogue or any uh, conversation even happening between the opposing sides. And that's where, again, the democracy dies. So I think for the state, I wouldn't also imagine 1984 kind of situation, but you're living already part of the a reality where the, the industry that's falling apart at the uh, local level will bring even more polarization to the public, uh, which again is detrimental to democracy. If you don't talk, you cannot possibly count that the democracy will survive. It's definitely a crisis that's just getting worse. And social media giants like Facebook feed off of this for profit. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, that's part of my everyday frustration in work because the lack of accountability, I mean, I understand the situation in the States, but there is also kind of the problem that many in the States do not really you know, pay attention how American social media or American tech becomes crucial communication infrastructure for so many countries outside the United States, but it faces zero accountability and basically holds a key to healthy democratic debate inside the country, but refuses to, you know, accept any responsibility for it. And our constant, you know, frustration is that we cannot get to the point where at least we're forcing them to listen to us about these concerns. So you are on the front lines of the disinformation war with trying to promote independent journalism and fact-checking. What advice do you have Mm. for people, uh, the public, for um, staying grounded in media literacy and understanding the dark arts of disinformation, deception out there? Look, I always give more, much more credit to those who do consumption of media or news than usually people do. So I don't get very patronizing. Well, people just need to be more educated and spend more time checking their sources and stuff like that. I mean, at some point, at some level, it is important. But I also think that the real problem, again, starts with a healthy media environment in general. If we have a healthy environment where especially local media outlets are strong, we can get to the point where people are getting just better quality information in general, and they don't go to social media networks to find information they really need. So the the problem that we see on the front lines that the majority of people go to social media and consume information from unverified sources or sources that spread false information, is just because they don't trust media outlets in general. And it's kind of catch-22 situation. Media outlets cannot get more high-quality journalists because they're starved on the resources but they also cannot get more resources if the public does not trust them and is not ready to pay or support them in some ways, you know? And I think once we try to address this problem, it will get gradually better in terms of resistance to propaganda and organized propaganda. It's something that is, of course, a massive problem. But again, it starts there, and it starts about in a global accountability of... Uh, social media platforms, primarily American social media platforms, when it comes to uh, space outside the United States as well. I love how I asked you about kleptocracy as a method for state capture and and countries like Russia spreading uh, the imperialism and, and expanding their network of proxy states. And you went immediately to the media because that was one of Putin's first weapons against the Russian people. What, it wasn't just the, the Chechnya war and all the disinformation that the Kremlin pushed for that. And obviously the, the murder and harassment of, of, of notable journalists covering that war, but also a clamping down of the media, including a popular comedy show in Russia. But that was sort of the beginning of Putinism, wasn't it? It was, it was his at- attack on any independent media inside Russia. It wasn't even full frontal attack. And again, that kind of a toolbox 
since then has been copied all over the place, outside of Europe as well, by other autocrats. You don't go frontal on journalism at first. You don't say like, you know, this is censorship where you have no right to exist. You deploy the help of your friends who are oligarchs and you help them to accumulate enough power over media outlets. And then when that power is accumulated, you finally can, you know, have enough say who's going out of business and who stays and those who stay, how they cover what you do with that country. I think it's fairly simple. And it's always shocking to me that the majority of people do not understand that. And they, again, think in terms of these absolutely surrealist scenarios of total government control over truth, which is not how democracy dies these days. Um, and that's where I would love to people to get that and uh, understand that better these days. Right. Like dictatorship doesn't arrive in a bunch of tanks saying, okay, you're now a dictatorship. It's this gradual chipping away of services, of rights, of press freedom, of civil rights. Well, yeah. And for example, like, can you, like, uh, during the COVID pandemic, illustrates even better this situation where you see how, for example, recently uncovered campaign by Russian propaganda and Russian proxy media outlets in Ukraine showed, you know, there were a number of investigations showed how this network kind of spreads anti-COVID, anti-vax sentiments that basically undermine public health, create kind of public health emergency and crisis within the country. But as a consequence, they destroyed even more trust towards media outlets and the government and state institutions, kind of dividing and polarizing public even more. So you can be really smart about it. On paper, this is just you know, pro-movement supporting anti-vax uh, sentiments in the country, when in fact, the ultimate goal is still remains the same to undermine democratic institutions within the country through this healthcare crisis. I think you, you know, the US is dealing with very much similar situations these days. I wanted to ask you about human rights, civil rights, namely LGBTQ rights in the region. Mm -hmm. Um, What is the current state of LGBTQ rights? And I I know Ukraine and Kiev Pride, as we mentioned in your bio, is a model, relative success story, given what Eastern European um, people are up against. Um, But so what is the current state of, of those civil rights across the region? And what are some success stories that give you hope? Of course, I love telling the story of uh, queer uh, queer equality fight in Ukraine, not only because it's very dear to me as a queer man coming from Ukraine, and I've been part of this story for many years, but also because it's so illustrative of the same dynamic that I uh, try to explain to people in a larger perspective of colonialism. I never separate those issues. I never separate the issue of human rights, equality, and democracy. And I never separate the issue of Russian colonialism and the dynamic with human rights equality in Russian neighborhood, which is basically still in many ways a legacy of colonial rule of our country. The uh, homophobic laws that still exist in some of the countries, including those criminalizing homosexuality like Uzbekistan, our direct uh, legacy of Russian colonial laws. The same was with Ukraine. And even to the day, despite Ukraine having such enormous progress with uh, queer rights, although of course it's still far away from optimal, uh, despite Ukraine having such a great progress in the last eight, seven years, a lot of issues are still embedded within the legacy that colonialism left in the country including homophobic laws from the Soviet Union and the first homophobic laws that have been ever introduced in Ukraine were uh, laws introduced by Russian imperial rule over Ukraine in early 20th century. And it's still there unaddressed, although, you know, some people are trying to point it out to that as well. But it's also a story, a good illustration of story, how it's not a local fight anymore, at least across Eastern Europe. But as I talk to other equality activists elsewhere, they also point out that it's a truly global fight because of the power of international conservative groups 
that have over our regions that pour so many resources to empower homophobes on local levels, including American organizations such as World Family Congress, which is kind of, you know, links to our conversation about global autocracy and basically has the same base there. That once we cannot address those agents that are based in the West and they have toxic influence, including through money, on uh, freedom, you know, democracy or uh, equality front lines across the world, we won't be able to fix it on the front line. So we'll need solidarity and help there and awareness and better awareness as well um, to try to fix it here on local level. So you, you mentioned a few things, but so what specifically more can the West do to support LGBTQ movements in the region? I know these rights are under attack still in the U.S., but I've always wanted to see more of a global movement, global organizing, a lot of resources in, in countries like the U.S. and Canada and the U.K., Germany and so forth, going towards countries like Ukraine to support the communities there that are on the front lines of pioneering these issues, which have a very powerful ripple effect for democracy generally. So what more do you think the West could do to support movements and uh, LGBTQ movements in the region, especially in, in Ukraine? <laughs> oh, look, I, I have this, uh, you know, cute story from some years ago when we were having um, Kyiv Pride in the Ukrainian capital. And it was, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a large event by now, attended by thousands of people, but it still has, uh, you know, very rigorous security. So there are lines of, you know, access points managed by police, where people are getting like checked if they have any anything uh, dangerous and stuff like that. So I was trying to access that uh, access, you know, security line, and I was prevented by a group of protesters that were like around twenty people, and they were screaming at me in English, you know, perfect English, saying like, "Well, you shouldn't join. This is like funded by the West. This is like all this homophobic, you know, propaganda and stuff." And I, you know, I decided to engage with them because, like, why would they chant in English, you know, at Ukrainian Pride? And it turns out it was a group of Christian activists from Pittsburgh. And I was, like, so perplexed by this situation. Why would you come here and prevent Ukrainians from joining um, something they want to join, exercise their freedom uh, of, you know, speech and congregation, stuff like that? And then you kind of understood that we have a big problem with transparency, how much those, say, American groups uh, spend money on shipping those people to prides on freedom front lines or sending direct money to uh, homophobic groups, how they operate. I think this transparency lacks. And I think the awareness of people and our allies, say, in America, the Congress, in the political spectrum, civil society also lacks that this is a big issue. And that's where I want the help to arrive, because I don't have resources of time to spend investigating those groups. But I would love to have more information, more transparency, how it operates, because you have uh, better access to it, to that kind of information. So I always engage and ask for help first there, I think, to kind of bring more light to uh, that transborder dynamic that is happening with homophobic groups and American homophobic groups in particular. Do you get any support from Western allies? Are the Western allies doing essentially the same groundwork where they show up for you guys and send money? No, I would say we've got so much help, like real good help not in terms of, you know, this uh, weird propaganda narrative that to just basically finance everything and force people to attend, you know, prides by <laughs> right, distributing right. Western grants. Right. There's no, no. Big gay Illuminati agenda that's driving this, no. Of course, there's gay, you know, gay conspiracy as well as homophobic <laughs> conspiracy, you know, and we all know each other and connected through the world. But I think like in... Um, in simplest way, how I can illustrate that uh, when it was still a challenge for us to organize a secure pride event, not because we didn't have people willing to come, but because the security situation was real bad and we couldn't get any support from police to protect us from, you know, homophobic, violent groups. 
first prize in, in Kiev and elsewhere across the region were met with violence in Tbilisi, for example, in other smaller cities in Ukraine. But then what happened is that we recruit our foreign allies who are based in the country just to help us to get meetings with our own bureaucrats and our own uh, officials that would deny them us our, those meetings before. So for example, you know, a Swedish ambassador would just go to police and schedule a meeting you know, meeting ambassador, police chief would, would definitely happen, right? But then during the meeting, he would just bring us along and, you know, sit at the table and say, you got to talk. And that's where the breakthrough happened. You know, just because they use their platform and their influence and the power to empower our ability to get through the bureaucratic wall, get through uh, uh, inability or, you know, homophobic, misconceptions of our own officials and start talking, starting cooperating, making sure that our officials do their job as they're supposed to do. So in this simple example, I could, you know, explain what kind of uh, support allyship we got in recent years here. The final question for you, where do you see the region going in terms of civil rights, press freedom? Do you see a hopeful landscape as long as Russia Kremlin aggression can be contained? Like, where do you see the region going in the coming years? And what gives you hope? Mm. How would I end on, you know, not depressing note? <laughs> Let me <laughs> think about it. No, uh, yeah, to be honest, I do feel still optimistic. Not so optimistic, but I see signs of hope that I can cling to. And first and foremost, I still think that the biggest problem is not so much in technical issues in the region, like, you know, how effective your corruption laws or how much nukes Russia has and stuff like that, but rather at the perspective that is lacking. What is the power dynamic in the region and where the problems fundamentally originate? And they originate in this messed up, power imbalance between colonial power and former slash current subjects. And I think once we, it helped me to understand this problem, this dynamic, it helped me to kind of figure out what to do and how to deal with it. And I think once other people get on board, it will be easier for them to make sense of it as well, rather than just a constant source of frustration and annoyance because it keeps happening. Nobody understands why Russia, for example, is so stubborn or why corruption, anti-corruption reforms are not happening as it's supposed to happen. Yeah, because we don't see a larger picture. We don't see colonial dynamic in the region. We don't see a global kleptocracy dynamic in the region. And this is just becomes a distraction. All those you know little things become a distraction from the larger picture. But I see people kind of starting, slowly moving into that direction. You guys are amazing at global cryptocracy awareness uh, and uh, awareness about, you know, building bridges between different situations with democratic rollbacks and stuff like that. That work is so important and it's actually helping people to make sense of it. And I think once we better at making sense of it, we will be able to recruit more allies for it because for the majority of people, it's just either a news cycle or this constant frustrating annoyance that they don't, they cannot make sense of it. So it just becomes something that they get really tired of it really quickly and just, you know, shrug it off. Our discussion continues and you can get access to that by signing up on our Patreon at the Truth Teller level or higher. We want to encourage you to donate to your local food bank, which is experiencing a spike in demand. We also encourage you to donate to Oil Change International, an advocacy group supported with a generous donation from the Greta Thunberg Foundation that exposes the true costs of fossil fuels and facilitates the ongoing transition to clean energy. We encourage you to help support Ukraine by donating to Razum for Ukraine at Razum, R-A-Z-O-M, for Ukraine.org. That's razumforukraine.org. 
We also encourage you to donate to the International Rescue Committee, a humanitarian relief organization helping refugees from Ukraine, Syria, and Afghanistan. Donate at rescue.org. And if you want to help critically endangered orangutans, already under pressure from the palm oil industry, donate to the Orangutan Project at theorangutanproject.org. Gaslit Nation is produced by Sarah Kenzier and Andrea Chalupa. If you like what we do, leave us a review on iTunes. It helps us reach more listeners. And check out our Patreon. It keeps us going. Our production managers are Nicholas Torres and Carlin Daigle. Our episodes are edited by Nicholas Torres, and our Patreon-exclusive content is edited by Carlin Daigle. Original music in Gaslit Nation is produced by David Whitehead, Martin Visenberg, Nick Farr, Damian Ariaga, and Carlin Daigle. Our logo design was donated to us by Hamish Smith of the New York-based firm Order. Thank you so much, Hamish. Gaslit Nation would like to thank our supporters at the producer level on Patreon and higher. Oh, and by the way, if you don't hear your name in this list and you've signed up, we're going to say your name starting in July and keep it going for however long you donated. FYI. <laughs> so we want to thank Eric Coffin. Jess Sauer. Chick Quinn. Lily Wachowski. Megan McNerney. Sean Rubin. Todd S. Perlstein. Pat. Kenny Maine. John Schoenthaler. Frank Jaquette. Ellen McGurr. Joel Ferron. Larry Gasson. Erica Moore. Karen A. Deal. Nico Phillips. Brian E. Castor. Andrea or Andrea Scalzo. Tatiana Bursch. Karen Heisler. Jordan Sanders. Ann Bertino. Chris Bravo. T.R. Dunstan. John Millett. David East. Stu. Shannon Nacy. Ida. Chris Fellow. Ben Wheaton. Joseph Mara Jr. Rich Halcombe. Thomas Scheibe, Kelsey Malsum, Julie Matthews, Meganopolis, Mark Mark, Barbara Kittredge, Matthew Womack, Silas Frank, Sean Berg, Kristen Custer, Tracy Ash, Benjamin Galuza, Kai Gillis, Sharon Hattrick, Irv Robinson, William Barry Reeves, Richard Smith, Emmy, Kevin Gannon, Yvonne Q, Mike Christensen, Sandra Collins, Katie Masuris, John Laughlin, Jeff Thompson, James D. Leonard, Leo Chalupa, <laughs> Carol Golstad, Michael Woldridge, <laughs> Crimer, no criming, Jason Benke, Joe Darcy, Ann Marshall, Jeremy Lewis, Joel Newman, Trigve, Christine M., D.L. Singfield, Matt Perez, Nicole Spear, Brian to Juden, Marine Murphy, Michelle Dash, Abby Road, Jans Alstrup Rasmussen, Victoria Olson, Alabama, ZW, Lisa Laflame, Jason Bainbridge, Sarah Gray, Mike Tripico, Diana Gallagher, Jennifer Ann Luter, John Ripley, Ethan Mann, Piet Yitzma, David Porter, Kate Cotton, Kim Mellon, Leah Campbell, Lynn Schneider, Jared Lombardo, Karen Humphreys, Eric Kaplan, Tanya Chalupa. Thank you all for your support. We could not make Gaslit Nation without you. Thank you. Thank you.